is that, that when your solar panel produces energy, it puts it through this charge controller and it charges up that battery so that when you have a cloudy day or your solar panel is broken or whatever it is, you will still have usable energy. After the battery comes your USB ports or your inverter or your DC plugs. Those are your output circuit. That's, that's how you draw energy out of the battery. And a big part of that for a lot of you is going to be an inverter. So what is an inverter? An inverter takes DC energy, which looks like a square, if you were to actually visualize it, and converts it into AC energy, which looks like a wave. An AC device cannot run off DC energy, and vice versa. The battery can only store energy in its DC form. So you need an inverter if you want to charge your laptop, if you want to run a fan, if you want to run any kind of household appliance with that normal two outlet plug that you would plug into a wall, that's what an inverter is going to do for you. Now, what's actually a better idea is to just use DC energy, like USB outlets, or for your laptop, you can go online and get a DC car charger, because then you're not making a conversion of energy. Which leads me into another really, really important subject, and this is a little bit more advanced, but it's very, very important. Every time you convert or move energy, there is a loss. And that loss is determined by the restriction of the system. So if we go back to the dam analogy, it's like if you were opening up that port. How wide that port is open is how much energy can flow through it. And if you restrict it, there is going to be a loss, which is why good wire sizes are important, which is why proper wire sizes are important, which is why proper connections are important, and which is why using good quality materials is important. The less you move around your energy, the further it will go. So those are the three major parts. You've got your solar panel, you've got your charge controller, you've got your battery, and then on the other side you've got the inverter. So I guess four major parts for most of you. So the next thing I want to talk about is solar safety. Um, it seems easy, it can be deceptively easy when you're dealing with solar, you're really only dealing with two wires, so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that inverter that I'm talking about can be drawn 50, 80, 100 amps, and not only is that enough to start a fire, that's enough to hurt you. So, the biggest point about safety that I can make, and I learned this working at a professional solar shop, is you need to have every wire fused within 12 to 24 inches of your battery. Otherwise, if something happens, that wire will become a welding cable and they can hold a lot of energy before they burn out. And that's not to scare you all. Again, solar is very easy. It's two wires, it's very basic. There's really only one, two things that you have to watch out for. The one thing that you have to watch out for is that everything is fused. So that if something goes wrong, the part that will fail is the fuse and not the wire or the plywood next to the wire or your charge controller or something else. That $5 fuse will save you a $5,000 rig. The second thing that's important to think about and be mindful of is wire sizes, connections, proper connections, things like heat shrink wrapping. These are a little bit more advanced topics, but if you go on YouTube, or one of my favorites is actually Blue Sea Systems, if you Google them, has fantastic charts out there. The marine electrical people have already come up with many standards. Um, one of them is the uh, ABYC standard and there's also the Coast Guard standard that boats have to adhere to. And if a solar system is installed on a boat, it has to adhere to these, these standards. So I would encourage you all to follow them. They're actually very basic. When you go on Amazon, these things will be certified as to these standards. 
So it's a really good way to navigate around all these products that are out there, which leads me into the next topic, pitfalls. Pitfalls with solar. We are in an environment with solar where it's kind of like the Wild West. Everybody and their mom makes solar, everybody and their mom works on solar, everybody and their mom freelances solar, everybody and their mom YouTubes and DIYs solar. So what the heck is right? What the heck is wrong? And more importantly, if I buy this solar panel, is it gonna go bad in a year? Or is it gonna go bad in 25 years? Um, so one of the things that I would encourage you all to look for as you look at solar products is to look for these standards and to specifically look for standards that have been established in the marine and boating environment. Um, a lot of your American companies already adhere to these standards. They already have for a very long time. And then you'll go look at your energy panel and maybe not so much. They can do good, they can do bad, but I will say to you, on average, I'm seeing these Renergy panels last three to five years. I've seen a couple of them come out of the box running 70 watts of solar on a 100 watt panel. I have a great solar panel on the roof of that Jeep you're welcome to check out right now. That panel is nine years old. It's a 250 watt panel and it still puts out 258 watts of electricity. It has a 15 year warranty and that's what you're gonna be looking at with a quality panel. If you look at any of these American companies or actually a lot of foreign companies like say Kyocera, they will have similar warranties. And if you're not seeing that on the product, there is a reason why it's not there. So be mindful of it. The same applies to charge controllers and somebody like Ryan who is willing to come here and talk to you not only about his own company, but about solar in general and things to watch out for, or an inverter company. Shout out on YouTube, where's the inverter companies? Hi Magnum. Look for these companies that stand by their products because there is no reason a solar panel should fail in five years, or that a charge controller should break and catch on fire in six months, or that a battery should fail in 14 months, or that an inverter comes out of the box smoking. There's no reason for this stuff other than the quality control on their side. So that is my word of warning and pitfalls with solar. You really do get what you pay for at this point. And in the next subject, which is a little black part, what can you be looking at if you pay for the right stuff? Well, an average solar system is expected to last 25 years at least. I would encourage you all as you're going out and as you're looking at getting solar systems for your rig, don't necessarily look at giving it up with the rig. You're not gonna get much more money for having solar, nobody cares. Trust me, I'm an off-roader right now. Um, I would encourage you to look at products that will last you more than one rig because these things will. I have a charge controller that's nine years old. I have a solar panel that's nine years old. I just transplant that from rig to rig. I've made batteries last seven years. If you do your homework and if you get proper good components, they will last you in the long run and it will save you tons of money, tons of frustration, and tons of time. Um, because you really have to think and plan for not necessarily what is the worst case scenario, but what is not the best case scenario. You're not gonna have three, four weeks straight of sunny weather. So if your 100 watt panel is just enough when you're on a sunny day, it's not gonna be enough when you decide to go up to Oregon. So that's something to think about. Are you waking up in the morning and your, your batteries are at 12.1 and your inverter is beeping at you on a cloudy day? it might be time to add another solar panel. It might be time to upgrade to a lithium battery. But if you save your pennies and you think about what your needs are and what your solar system is telling you, you can spend a lot less money in the long run because these components will last a very long time and are repairable and replaceable. And there are people out there like Ryan who will answer your phone call and bend over backwards to help you. I know he's helped me a ton. 
So that leads me into the next big thing. How do I know? How do I know if I'm damaging my batteries or if I'm drawing too much or if I have enough solar or if I have this or that or the other thing? It's called the battery monitoring system. Victron's got a pretty good one. Trimetric's got one that you will hear about a lot. Uh, it's the classic one. There are a bunch of knockoff companies that make them. Again, you get what you pay for, but a good BMS is a really good idea to think about right off the bat because that voltage meter is not going to tell you everything you need to know to diagnose if something is wrong or if you're using too much energy or maybe that welder you're trying to run is a little bit too powerful for your battery. A voltage meter alone will not tell you these things, but a trimetric will. And, it, and I use trimetric because it's probably the most expensive one out there, and I think they run about $180 now. That's a lot cheaper than a battery, if you think about it that way. That's a lot cheaper than killing your first battery. And so if you get a BMS, you can save yourself from that because you can set yourself to limits and you can notice your habits. And likewise, I would encourage you to start off small and as you find that you have more needs, add on to your system. Look at it like Legos and, and think of yourself as building the foundation to your own private power company. And if you look at it that way, and you're able to monitor what is actually going on, your system will tell you what your needs are and you will have a lot less frustration and spend a lot less money and you will end up with crazy kooky systems like a 250 watt panel on top of a Jeep Cherokee. Solar is good. It doesn't have to be frustrating and it's not complicated. It's only two wires. So, those are, those are my basics. I, I did want to let you guys know on my website, Nomads Everywhere, I will have a free book on solar coming out. The first chapter is actually out there right now. Um, I will be finishing that book by this summer. Feel free, to look, feel free to spread it to your friends. I would like this proper knowledge to get out there. So if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up there or read the book that I'm producing by this summer, and I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Ryan. <laughs> I, I really like Seth's presentation because he really, you know, puts it very simply, you know. Uh, renewable energy is just that, it's renewable. So people often, you know, they say, how much solar do I need, right? That's a common question, how much solar do I need? And like Seth says, um, start small, you know. Really, the, the monster of all loads would be is if you have like a commercial refrigerator, an AC refrigerator. But your TVs, your laptops, stuff like that, really don't draw a lot of power. You know, if you switch out your, you know, your 5150 bulbs for LED, little LED bulbs, and they'll draw a whole lot less current, and next thing you know, you don't need a generator. You're like, you know, you only need a generator for when you want to run the microwave, you know, or when you, when you want to fire up the crock pot or something like that. But even coffee makers don't even draw that much power. So you can get away with a, a small system for modest loads. You don't need to be the people that, you know, they put like 9,000 watts of, you know, solar on their roof and they want to run air conditioning and everything like that. I mean, good luck in air conditioning going, that's not going to happen. Um, but, I mean, don't be intimidated. You know, it is a nice thing to add on. You know, make sure you have a, a qualified installer do it because it's the little details that make the big difference when you make an install. You know, especially if you're running wires and this and that, something goes wrong. And you're like, well, how do I troubleshoot it? You know, it's like, well, if you had a good installer, you won't have to troubleshoot it, but it's not going to break. <coughs>